Hey, traders, David Frost, My Strategic Forecast. You're here for another episode of Common Sense Market Analysis. Today is Monday, September 19, 2022. We're looking at a daily chart of the SPY or Spider, which is the proxy for the S&P 500. What do we have on the docket today? We've got a whole plethora of things on the docket today. This is a big week by definition of there's a lot of stuff going on. We've got Kabuki Theater on Wednesday. So the Fed meets on Tuesday and it culminates with the FOMC announcement on Wednesday, which they'll be announcing what kind of interest rate increase to the Fed funds rate they're making this time around. Is it going to be 75 basis points or is it going to be a full percentage point? That is the prevailing thing being discussed in the media. Now, all in all, that doesn't really matter in the big scheme of things. After all, what's the difference between one quarter of 1% this week? Nothing. It's the sentiment. It's the excitement. It's the emotions. It's the waited for the Fed announcement with bated breath, which is why we termed it Kabuki Theater. It's a show. All that being said, again, we don't care how much they raise or don't raise. What we care is, what is the market participant's reaction to whatever happens after the fact? That's what's important. And in tonight's video, we're going to show you some interesting stuff that most people just simply aren't seeing or looking at. Let's start with the daily chart of the SPY. We'll see if anything's jumping off the page at us, and then we'll flip over to some other stuff that I think you're going to find interesting. Last week, they broke the neckline, which is the head and shoulders pattern created by virtue of what the market did. Here's the left shoulder. The neckline begins there. It's a huge head, and then you have a right shoulder, and they triggered the head and shoulders last week by closing below. We had some follow through and now they're making a run to retest the neckline from the underside. Now, here's the deal. If they were to close above that neckline, it will negate the head and shoulders pattern. You will likely get a short squeeze for a short period of time because once they, if they negate that head and shoulders pattern, Traders will be taking off their short positions. Not all traders, just the ones that understand that the pattern will have been negated if they close above. Now, does that mean they can't close right back below and go down? No, it doesn't. It's just from a textbook perspective, how we have to treat the pattern by definition. They did not make a new low today. This morning, we had what's called the pajama jockeys slash buy the dip crowd step in first thing in the morning. They started buying up the market and then there was another push late in the day. We'll get to the numbers and stuff from an intraday perspective in a little while when we take a look at inside the numbers. What we want to look at is what happened on the daily chart. Well, we have a reversal candle. That's item number one. We finished on the highs, that's item number two, that's generally speaking a bullish formation. It was not on good volume or tremendous volume, therefore we know it was not comprised of institutional participation for the most part. It's a bounce in a downtrend, it's a dead cat bounce, whatever you want to call it. But we do is we take the information that the market provides and we use it to our advantage. And today, the information, just taking it at face value, is a bullish close, a bullish finish closing at the highs, a reversal candle. All those things are bullish. And it tells us what we already knew is under normal garden variety market behavior. And we said this last week, if they break the neckline at some point, they will rally back to run a test of said neckline. But wait, there's more. Last week, we took a look at the futures contract. Once again, here is the December ES contract, and you can see it has a different neckline price than does the SPY. Doesn't matter right now why. What matters is we have to take it at face value, and this afternoon, toward the end of the day, 
They made an attempt to touch and run a test of the neckline. Maybe they did, maybe they didn't. It's hard to say to the tick whether you have the neckline drawn in, but you can see from a this is what they were attempting to do perspective, they did make a new low in the futures contract today, and then they ended up running a test of the underside of the neckline. So here's the $100,000 question. What happens if they close above the neckline tomorrow in the futures, but not in the SPY? That's a great question. And it creates what we call in the trading parlance a conundrum. And that's what the markets do, specifically leading up into an important event. They create deception. They create divergences. They create conundrums where you don't know exactly what's going to happen because you have one thing telling you one thing, you have another thing telling you another thing, and what you wind up with is a bucket full of uncertainty. Remember, the market's job is to make as many traders and investors look like fools as much of the time as possible. That's technically the job of Trick and Company, also known as the Trick, Trap, Fool, and Frustrate Crew. I'm watching both the futures market as well as the cash index and the S&P for clues one way or the other. Another thing to keep in mind, put it on a sticky note, tomorrow being Tuesday is Turnaround Tuesday. Leading up into the Fed announcement, they make things look bullish today. They flip them around tomorrow, pull the rug out from the Johnny-come-latelys that are also known as the Buy the Dip crowd, also known as the Pajama Jockeys from this morning. Don't be surprised if they pull the rug out on Turnaround Tuesday. By the way, what's the number you want to be looking at in the SPY to at least run a test of the trend line? And you just bring your cursor over here and you see it's coming in around tomorrow, will be around 392.60, 392.70. In that neighborhood, let's just call it 392.50 to 393 ballpark to run a successful test or a sufficient test of the trend line. Start closing above, meaning daily above, and all of a sudden, you open the door for the short squeeze we discussed earlier. By the way, what do we have following the Kabuki Theater event this week that culminates with the FOMC announcement on Wednesday in addition to the Fed press conference run by Jerome Powell, the chairman of the Federal Reserve. After that, we have another tinfoil hat event. When is that event? It's Thursday night after the market closes. So there is some space in between the Fed announcement and the next tinfoil hat event. Now let's just cut to the chase. The tinfoil hat events have a tendency to, but they don't have to, have an impact on the market in terms of a reversal or an acceleration. And the way we gauge it is we watch the tape leading up into the tinfoil hat event. So let's just say for argument's sake, this is one potential schematic. Write this down, put it on a sticky note. Let's say they have a turnaround Tuesday and they send the market back down, regardless of to where, let's just say it's around the lows, today's low, Friday's low, it's all around the same thing. They get into a chop shop formation, and all of a sudden, leading up into the Fed announcement, they end up sending the market down further. Again, go with me on the potential schematic. This is the bear case schematic leading into the Fed announcement and through the Fed announcement. So Wednesday, it finishes negative. All of a sudden, Thursday, they're killing the tape some more. Everybody thinks the whole world's going to come to an end. They start to throw the baby out with the bathwater. They're hitting some much lower numbers. And then all of a sudden, at some point around Thursday night, things kick in. The tinfoil hat event gets lit up. And all of a sudden, a miraculous bounce starts to occur on Friday. Write that down. Put it on a sticky note. It is, in fact, one of the schematics. Another schematic is recapturing the trend line and getting the short squeeze. So we have two schematics on the board, and the one in the middle is they stay in a chop shop formation without the market really telling you anything or indicating anything without them actually making the move after the fact. 
Let's check out what happened inside the numbers today. Now, the market was rather quiet most of the day. Little bit of move in the morning, little bit of movement in the afternoon, in between a whole bunch of chop shop formation stuff. Let's go through some of the important stuff. I'll point out some interesting things, and then you can pause the video, read the notes, and go double check the work on the charts to capture the rest of the information if you're at all interested in either already are trading in the market during the trading day or would like to be an intraday trader specifically around the S&P and related markets. We woke up red as we've got another bout of selling at zero dark 30 on our hands. They're testing the lows made Friday and even a little lower. What's down there you ask? Well, we've got one of those no man land situations coming up where below a certain number, in this case 38066, is the hard line that opens the door to a gap that won't be filled until they get down below 378. So in terms of S&P handles, that was going to be like a 25 to 30 handle space from this 38066 all the way down to fill the gap and find some kind of an assemblance of an interim or short-term intraday low. 30 handles was a big move, so it was worth mentioning at zero dark 30. Now, we all know they can find support and bounce before the gap, but this is awareness stuff. This is the pregame warm-up routine. This was big picture stuff in the spirit of being prepared for game time. Now, if they do the thing where they bounce them into the opening bell, they're going to try and recapture 384.30 for starters. Write that number down, put it on a sticky note. We think better in pictures, right of the vertical is today's activity. This is a five-minute SPY chart. And here, early in the day, you can see 384.30 was important for them to recapture and then run a back test of before trying to rally. Once they hit overhead resistance, and we'll get to that in a little while, they came back to do what? Run a test of 384.30. Now, you'll see later on in the notes that became, and it was early on, our pivot. That is essentially the Below number, the bears take control and they push the market down again. And if they stay above, they have other business in the northbound lane. Let's move along, see what else we have as the day gets underway. 8.52, as we get closer to the opening bell, they're doing the thing where they creep back up north toward 384 and change. Shocker. They were trying to run an early rescue operation. So the fact that we know certain numbers are important, we come up with a zone and the zone was 384 to 384.50, where they should find the overhead resistance early in the day. And you saw how they were bouncing around early in the day. Once they recaptured 384.30, they were bouncing back and forth. They went up a little higher. They came back to retest it. Once they stayed above, it became support. It is and was the pivot. Let's move along. Now, when the bell opened below 382.11, which was Friday's low, opens the door for the lower stuff. They came close, they never hit it, and they immediately bounced away courtesy of the buy the dip crowd, the pajama jockey crew. If they're able to get above the pivot, the next target would be 385.65, posted early. Back to the pictures, the top line is, in fact, 385.65. The top line is now 385.65, and you can see what happened once they recaptured the pivot. They ran a test of that number. It was overhead resistance. They pulled back toward the pivot, yada, yada. We're moving along. Read the notes. Go back to the chart to double check the work. I'm going to point out a couple of important things as the morning grew on, as the day grew on, as the storyline began to develop. By 10.30 a.m., 388 to at least up to... 389 is a likely target today for the bullish case. We raise the pivot for the bull case, so we have really two pivots. Some days we do this where we have the bear pivot and the bull pivot, and in between they just chop around going back and forth. 384.30 was opens the door for lower numbers. 385.75 was the bull case pivot that opened the door for 388 to 389. And there you see was the target, 388. They went up to about 388.50 and change right in between the two numbers. That was the target. They achieved the target. And it's funny how that works. We're moving along. Read the notes. Go back to the chart to double check the work. Even while we're waiting on the Fed, they're making an attempt 
to run a test of the underside of that neckline. What about stocks on the move? We had a nice little list today, but since they bounced the tape right out of the gate, it took a lot of the opportunity away. But at the end of the day, one particular stock hit its number. We'll take a look at Coinbase. Pretty simple stuff. They creep into the first number, go a little bit lower to the second number. It was a zone. They were pretty close together. Once they ran a test of the second number, they decided to turn around, immediately go back up in the other direction, provide a stand-up double to any trader that was still taking this trade later in the day. The numbers work. What's going on over in Camp IWM? So they've recaptured the neckline that broke on Friday, immediately back above today on a closing basis. So is this a hint of something that's coming down the pike. We treat each market independent of one another, but we certainly can build a puzzle with pieces along the way and evidence when markets are telling us certain things. The IWM happens to be my favorite market leading indicator and therefore this becomes a puzzle piece and it's on the table. Let me just reiterate something. Just because there's a head and shoulders pattern doesn't mean it will play out all the way, won't play out all the way, won't fail, will fail. This is the technical definition of how it works. That's what we're going over, but it doesn't really have anything to do with what happens in the market day in and day out. It's a way to look at it from a bearish or bullish perspective. In other words, in short, I wouldn't necessarily want to be short the S&P 500 if they recapture the neckline. That's the way you use this information. And let me add something else. As I look around the horn and I look at a lot of charts, a lot of different things, a lot of different stocks all day long, all night long, I'm always looking at stuff. And one thing keeps jumping off the page at me. There is a tremendous amount of head and shoulders patterns on a lot of different charts consistent with what we're seeing in the IWM, in the S&P 500, all that stuff. And what that tells me is two things. Either it's going to be one whopper of a sell-off and everything's going to get thrown out with the bathwater and it's really going to happen sooner than later, or it's going to be one hell of a Lollapalooza type of failure and there's going to be one heck of a short squeeze that lasts a little while issuing a conveyor belt of pies in the face. We have the perfect recipe this week with the Fed announcement, the tinfoil hat event, a lot of different things can happen. It should be an exciting week. What about the folks down at the transportation department? Well, they got walloped on Friday along with the FedEx news where they kind of warmed that the global economy was on, shall we say, shaky ground. Now, once again, they didn't make a new low. They finished near the highs, which puts them in no man's land with a gap that's pretty far away. It's about 400 and some odd points away from current price. Now, if the transports are going to have some hell of a snapback to get up to fill that gap, then you would think the other markets would be following suit at the same time. Food for thought, puzzle piece, put it on a sticky note. It's on the table and in writing. The Q people look primarily the same as the S&P finished near the highs, didn't make a new low. All the bullish characteristics are in place in the Q world. Again, beware of turnaround Tuesday, and while we're waiting on the Fed, they can certainly bounce the tape around tomorrow and certainly half the day on Wednesday until we have the official Kabuki release. Financials followed suit. They had a really good day. They're looking to run a test of the convergence of these moving averages. What's interesting, and this is always by choice, I always find these interesting, and we seem to find these a lot in the XLF. They didn't fill the gap today. They missed by a penny. There's no accidents or coincidences. That was by choice. They could have filled the gap. They didn't fill the gap. Hell, they could have ran up into the convergence of those moving averages. They just chose to stop when and where they chose to stop. Is that telling us anything material leading into tomorrow? Not really. I just find it interesting information, and I'm trying to train you to look for these type of things that sometimes can be a tip-off to one thing or another. In this particular case, I'm not sure it's a tip-off to anything, but I can't help but notice these things. What about Smash Mouth? Well, we have somewhat of a lagging situation in Smash Mouth. Not only lagging from the 
chart perspective, daily, weekly, all kinds of stuff. But even on a day like today, we didn't have the relative strength. We had relative weakness against the S&P, relative weakness by just a little bit against the actual NASDAQ market or Qs themselves. As we know, Smash Mouth or the Philadelphia Semiconductor Index is a pretty good proxy for the tech space as a whole. And they were up a little bit today, but they weren't up more or even equal to the S&P or the Qs. Again, we can't really take a whole lot away from that with our pending Kabuki this week and all the other stuff going on. But nevertheless, we have to take note of all these things. They are puzzle pieces. Markets are always trying to tell us something. The question is, Can we read the information? Are we seeing what she's trying to tell us? That's another $64,000 question. Have I told you how much I appreciate each and every one of you? Without you, these videos are not possible. That is true and accurate information. We're pulling the ripcord here today. I'm David Frost, my strategic forecast. Thanks again for tuning in to another episode of Common Sense Market Analysis.